Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to PAX Unplugged. Yay. It is so great to see all of your smiling faces, and we are so happy to be here for our 50 Years of D&D &D Adventures panel. I just have one question for everybody here today before we get started. Who here likes D&D? &D? Like, <laughs> is it OK? <laughs> Is it fine? Oh, good. We're in the right place. Oh, good. I'm not lost. I'm in the right city. Excellent. That, that is especially great because we are indeed here going to spend a good chunk of this panel talking about adventures that we love most from D&D's illustrious 50-year history. We have five categories of adventures that we're going to be talking about that made an impact to the way D&D is played today. And we are going to be talking about our favorite adventures in those categories. After we get through all of that uh, fun uh, jibber-jabber, we are then going to get to uh, some of D&D's features, some of D&D's publications for 2024 and the exciting new things that you can expect uh, upcoming from the D&D design team. So you're saying we in the present are going to travel back into the past we to are. remember fondly our adventures and then journey to the future? Past, I know. present, and future, all present. We are time moment. travelers. That's right. I'm and going to pretend that this isn't just a plain old mundane PowerPoint clicker and that it is instead a time travel device <laughs> letting us go back in history to talk about all I, the things we love about D&D. &D. Amanda, I also think it is worth pausing just for a moment to celebrate the fact that the game is about to be 50 years old. <laughs> This I wish I could say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, because your birthday is on uh, leap day, you're only, what, 12, 13? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I dare not say. Boy, Everybody here can do math. <laughs> Our very own boy genius, Chris Perkins. <laughs> So before we get into all of those fun times, we would like to introduce ourselves to you. I am Amanda Hammond. I am a senior designer on the design team in the D&D studio, and I'm joined by... Don't we have a slide for this? We... 
should do that. Time, time <laughs> Look, you guys, it's us. And, uh, Amanda, I thought you were going to also talk about a, a memory from your earliest uh, experience with D&D. Ah, yes. So if you all, as you introduce yourselves down the line, could share a little bit of uh, a memory that you might have from your early days of D&D or just a fun tidbit about you getting started um, in D&D. I myself have been playing D&D since I was 15 years old, and I have very strong memories of sitting around with my friends uh, in his basement, going through D&D books that I was seeing for the first time as my friends were introducing me to this game. And I loved fiction, and I loved fantasy, and I loved um, all sorts of different properties that made this a very natural fit for me. And I remember distinctly opening up that third edition player's handbook and reading about how to make a wizard, and reading about how magic worked, and reading about how uh, you built your own story and you played through your own story, and that's what D&D was. And I just remember thinking, this is a game that was made exactly for me. I think I love this the most that I've ever loved anything in my life. And I, I want to say that more than 20 years later, I think I still feel that way. <laughs> awesome. I am James Wyatt. Uh, I'm a senior game designer on the D&D team. And when Amanda was uh, cracking open that first D&D book at the age of 15, I was already working at Wizards. <laughs> I think I met you when I was about 18 at Gen Con. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Anytime, buddy. <laughs> so I've been at Wizards for 24 years, 24 years in January. Uh, I've worked on a lot of stuff. But uh, in the Christmas of 1977, uh, I, was, I was nine. Um, I had watched The Hobbit on television, The Rankin-Bass Hobbit and the animated Lord of the Rings movie. I loved that stuff. And my friend and I used to run around the backyard pretending we were t the two blue wizards that, uh, whose names at the time were not known. Um, and Christmas that year, my older brother, three years older than I was, got the original D&D box set as a Christmas present. I desperately tried to figure out how this was a game that I could play and failed. Um, but I did use it as a monster manual, as resources for the monsters that my friend and I would run around our backyard pretending to kill. That is my earliest memory of D&D. It took two more years before the, uh, the Holmes basic set came out in 79. That, that same friend and I went in together and bought it. And that is how the story got here. <laughs> I'm Chris Perkins. I'm one of the two game architects for 5th edition. and. I have a similar experience to yours, James, so I can be really brief. I did not know how to play D&D for a long time. Um, I first discovered D&D when I saw the monster manual, the first edition monster manual, next to a rack of porno mags. <laughs> um, it was in one of those revolving, you know, miscellaneous books things. And I took it out, fell in love with the art in it, took it home, and tried to back engineer the game just reading the monster manual. I thought it was a game about monsters fighting monsters, so that's all my friend and I did for the first year of play until we found another book, was have monsters fighting monsters. I'm Jeremy Crawford, the other game architect of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and I started playing D&D when I was six years old, back with first edition, so this would have been, I think, 1978. My sister introduced it to me, and ironically, given the fact that I now oversee the game's rules, at first, I had no idea the game had rules. Uh, and, and this was sort of a, a common origin story for many of us who started in first edition because originally, when this astounding game was being unleashed upon the world, the books weren't all out yet. Uh, or people had a hard time finding certain books, like there was no Amazon at the time, you know, you were at the whim of your local bookstore or hobby store. So in our case, we had no rule books, we had an adventure. And so I thought D&D, for my first year or so of play, was a game where someone read out a description of a room and then you just made up whatever you wanted to do. And, and uh, which I loved and I carry that spirit with me today, but then I fell in love even more later when I discovered there was actually a framework for all of this make-believe and I have loved playing with the D&D rules ever since. Awesome. Right, so now let's get on to talking about some adventures. Clicking my little, my time, time travel there. machine. 
Let's travel back in time to 1986 when the very first Dungeon Magazine was published. So should we talk about the categories a little bit? Sure. So no. uh, actually, this slide has <laughs> got a funny typo in it. Um, it's not short adventurers. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to talk about halflings and gnomes. <laughs> we're here we to could? talk about short adventurers, uh, which it's became true. very plentiful when Dungeon Magazine came out. For those who don't know, a magazine is a very thin book. <laughs> you can sometimes see it in stores, but not so much these days. Um, but this was one of two magazines that D&D had to kind of deliver a short article or adventure content to folks. The other was, of course, Dragon Magazine. I was going to make him guess. <laughs> I'm sorry, James. Uh, and James and I have a, a strong connection to this magazine because this is kind of how we got our foot in the door. My first adventure was published in Dungeon Magazine in uh, 1998, January. It was a underwater adventure called The Sunken Shadow. And for those who don't know, 1998 was a year that came out before the aughts. <laughs> <laughs> and Dungeon Magazine was really great because it did introduce the idea of short adventures that would come out on a regular basis that DMs would insert into their own campaigns or that they would run over weekends um, for short sessions with their own players. And really, I think, influenced some of the, the later anthologies that we ended up publishing for D&D. Like? A thing that still has that typo, but, <laughs> and also could involve halflings and gnomes. <laughs> so Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, one of the more recent adventure anthologies that, um, that we published, uh, focuses on adventures that are all in their own micro setting, really allowing DMs to sink their teeth into some of these brand new, um, very fantastical settings. Keep talking. That James is going to tell us more about, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> I wanted to see what's coming next. <laughs> so 13 short adventures with Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, and, and they are very imaginative. They've got beautiful arts. Um, do any of you have a favorite adventure through uh, in Journeys? Oh, gosh. Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. I've been running the Volcano one, the name of which I can't remember. Um, there is, oh, the, um, gosh, Aaron's Adventure. The mind, the mind water. <laughs> Blood something or other. Um, yeah. I don't want to get it wrong, um, but it's, it's kind of a chilling, disturbing uh, adventure where you're trying to solve a mystery in this, uh, in this land that's sort of in the, in the grip of an unknown evil, and there's all kinds of mythology kind of baked into the, the evil that has sort of surfaced, and it's all sort of psychological. Mm. Mm. It's, it's an evil born out of psychology, and I really, really love that idea that evil comes from within people. Who knows what secrets lurk? Exactly. <laughs> and so it, it's very disturbing, and it's got this creature called a soul shaker, which is quite unnerving to Ooh, look at. that's a good one. That's a good one. The one thing I love about books like Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, as well as Dungeon Magazine, is they were in some ways returning to the game's initial style of adventures, which were very short. Uh, and uh, it, it's funny to think now that we have, so many of us have cut our teeth on these adventures that can take sometimes months to play through. In those early days of D&D, many of the adventures you could play in a single evening. And so any time we do these short adventures, we are really in a way tipping our hat to those early days, uh, to adventures like uh, the village of Hamlet, mm -hmm. uh, which was like Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, a micro setting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we were working on Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, the village of Hamlet was a, a sort of comparison point as we conceptualized what could it look like to create a series of micro settings because this classic D&D adventure which was basically the size of a pamphlet, uh, gave you a fleshed out town, a little dungeon nearby that you could go through, and you could play through all of the meat of it if you wanted to in a single session, or if you were like my group of kids when we played it, we managed to stretch that thing out for weeks uh, as we went around to 
every single NPC's house. <laughs> to see how much gold they had stashed under their mattress. <laughs> yes. Door by door, do you have treasure? No. Do you have treasure? But no. they all did. <laughs> that was the fun part of it, right? Yes. Another wonderful thing about the short adventures is it let, you, it let us explore a bunch of niche concepts that yes. probably would not have been able to do in a longer adventure or to um, play with things that existed elsewhere in the game. Like one of my favorite old dungeon adventures, House of Cards, mm -hmm. is a clever use of the deck of many things. Um, by the way, quick plug, we just released the deck of many things, or we will be releasing a deck of many things project very soon. Yes. Um, and it's very exciting. I have always loved that particular item. And to see an adventure be able to take an item and actually build a story around it is something we saw a lot of in our shorter adventures at the time. Um. So two great things about short adventures like Dungeon Magazine or like these anthology products. One is they're fantastic for, uh, oh, our regular DM isn't prepared tonight. Does somebody else want to run something? Or we're missing some players and can't continue the regular campaign. Quick, somebody pick up a short adventure, prep it and read it, read it and run it. And two, they're a really good model for learning how to write adventures where you don't feel like you have to emulate a 192-page book. Please don't try to emulate a 192-page book unless you're actually publishing adventures. But for what you're running for your home game, look at a shorter adventure. You can actually think smaller than that. You really just need an outline of what's going to happen. Um, but but a, a, a much more manageable model for what an adventure can and, and often does look like. Exactly, right? And it's a lot like a lot of other narrative expressions, right? There are things that work as, uh, as short films or series much better than they do as a full-length feature film. And that's the way I like to think of short adventures. They are a short episode of something that um, is bite-sized, is palatable, um, but is also often just very uh, chocked full of story and meaning and a really fun experience for the DM and the players that doesn't outstay its welcome. That's, that's why I like this category. And the other thing that I love about Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel in particular, which we will talk more about when we talk about um, another category, <clears throat> is the way that, that adventures do reveal a setting. Yes. Um, often, if I'm looking at a setting book, I find myself wondering, what is the adventure that, I, that, that, that the designer expects me to have here? Um, an adventure just tells you that up front, and we'll talk more about that later, but um, the micro settings in this book are, are just, they're evocative settings, but you know right away what to do in them because we give you a little adventure to run. And they are in contrast to another very classic style uh, of D&D, &D, which is the style I think a lot of us started out with, and that is adventure campaigns. This is the, the standard long form. You get together with your friends every week or every couple of weeks and you play through a long adventure campaign. Um, there's been many of them throughout the history of D&D. Uh, one of our favorites is also happens to be the first 5e campaign, which is Tyranny of Dragons, you'll see up there. It was originally published in two hardcovers that was then collected into one book, and there were multiple expressions of Tyranny of Dragons in other media. There um, were some Adventurers League um, adventures, and also the Neverwinter MMO uh, ventured into Tyranny of Dragons land. And so this is, this is a very fun style of play that allows you to continue to have that, uh, that regular um, D and D experience and have a continuity that lasts throughout several weeks or months or years in some cases. Yeah, at the beginning of the launch of Fifth Edition, it was very important that our first campaign be dragon centric. Um, but what we did with this, and Jeremy would recall this, is we wanted to hearken to the most iconic Dungeons and Dragons dragon themed setting, uh, Dragonlance. Yes. but do it in the Forgotten Realms. What would a Dragonlance-like story be mm -hmm. in the Forgotten Realms? And I, I love that by doing that, we also got to delve into the macro setting of D&D, &D, of the multiverse, because one of our goals right away with 5th edition was to show how all of the different worlds of D&D &D are connected through the Great Wheel, which has recently been featured in Planescape, and this was our chance to show that Tiamat doesn't just have her sights set on the world of Kryn, but she is after every world that uh, she can get her claws on. Uh, and also, this adventure campaign was building on what for me as a kid was my favorite adventure campaign, which was the original Dragonlance <laughs> modules. And, uh, since I started playing so long ago, 
Dragonlance for me was an, a, a campaign before it was a novel series because I started DMing DL1, the very first Dragonlance adventure, Dragons of Despair, before the first novel was even out. Uh, so for, for anyone who's ever had, ha, ever had that experience of feeling almost like if you're running the original Dragonlance campaign, oh, we're kind of in the shadow of the books, I can tell you there was a mythical time where, <laughs> where many of us did actually get to play that campaign before the books uh, had such a, th a thrilling impact on many of us. Yeah, because just the way the timing worked, the writing on the adventures started ahead of the ahead of the novels, but the novels came out so quickly that they outpaced the adventures, so there was, there was only that small window of time. I think getting a chance to play through some of our favorite settings from potentially fiction or seeing our favorite settings represented in fiction is sort of a classic experience. I think all of us up here at some point have experienced that. And I want to say one more thing about Tima. Do Sorry. the thing. <laughs> Do the thing. Um, I, I'm just looking at this art, this art, um, and thinking about that first edition monster manual that Chris found on the magazine rack. Um, and, and you know, Tima was in there and had stats there for you to fight, and that was like a formative part of D and D lore. As this, you know, Tima mythologically has roots in the ancient Near East, but uh, is a uniquely D&D &D character as a five-headed dragon with the, the heads of the five kinds of evil dragons. And the fact that, that she has become this character that is so um, long-lived within the game, uh, it's super cool to me. One of my other favorite uh, adventure campaigns is from third edition, The Red Hand of Doom, which oh. is another Tiamat-focused story. Slightly different, yeah. though, because it's kind of told as a war story where there's this this uh, powerful half-dragon general taking over the land in the name of Tiamat, but a really, really solid third edition campaign. And, and let us not forget that the awesome Tiamat was also a regular in the D&D cartoon. Yes. Oh, it's so true. <laughs> really an iconic villain. Oh, right. This is why Amanda was looking to me. Yeah. <laughs> Push the button, put James White on the spot. <laughs> I wrote our... this adventure. He did, he did. Why don't you tell us about it, James? Uh, so, um, in, uh, this came out in 2002. So I think sometime in 2001, I got pulled into a meeting with uh, several folks at Wizards and several novel authors who worked for Wizards um, to, to work, to be a part of this enormous story event um, all about uh, the god Lolth um, the uh, demon queen of spiders uh, going silent. She underwent sort of a metamorphosis in the abyss, but her silence had a tremendous impact on um, her cults within the Forgotten Realms. And so we did a series of six novels, uh, each by a different author, and somehow junior game designer James uh, got called on to do the, the adventure component of that series. So that was City of the Spider Queen. Um, which is a, a, was an awesome experience for me, but um, a really fun exploration of what happens when a, a city that is dominated by Loth worshippers uh, loses control. Uh, uh, Loth's priests lose control because Kiransali's cult steps in, the, the goddess of um, undeath. And uh, this was a kind of ridiculously huge third edition adventure with endless stat blocks of, <laughs> of NPC warriors and mages that um, was, was really kind of a headache. <laughs> but it's still one of your favorites. Still one of my favorites. I, I ran it for a group all the way up to 18th level in third edition. They wanted to play on after that. I said no. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I didn't nominate this adventure, by the way. Somebody else talked about why they, they like it. <laughs> I, I, I love this because, going back to the discussion about playing through fiction uh, in D&D and vice versa, I entered into um, the lore of D&D through reading a lot um, of, of fiction books um, involving Loth and um, the, the Underdark, and I was just a really big fan of Forgotten Realms. I, I loved all of those old uh, novels that were written, and uh, this adventure 
actually gave us the opportunity to play through and experience some of that lore. And having read the novels and seen how scary Loth is and how scary Loth's cult was, that was a really, really fun thing for, for young me to be able to play through that at a high level and sort of overcome that sort of scary fear that I felt reading the books about how all of these cultists were so scary and Noel now is the hero and I was able to uh, sort of thwart those evils. And I think it was a really fun time for that reason. Awesome. I'm just a softie when it comes to Underdark Adventures. Yes. Anytime I can get an adventure set in the Underdark, I'll run it, I'll play it, you name it. I had a lot of fun playing around with architecture in this adventure, um, in the Underdark setting. And, and I'm a sucker for anything having to do with elves, and there are, of course, a significant number of elves in this uh, adventure. Yes. And uh, I love the many permutations of elves, not only in City of the Spider Queen, but throughout D&D's history. So speaking of adventure categories, another one that some of you might be familiar with is the tried and true dungeon crawl, the play experience in which your characters kick down doors, kill monsters, and take stuff. And that has been around since the very beginning of D&D's history. Or in this case, kick down the doors and get killed by monsters. Or <laughs> that works too. Very deadly d and I feel as if that, that set a precedent. This and some of the others we're talking about today. I, Tomb of Horror is as infamous as, as a, a killer dungeon. Um, it was really designed to be, oh, oh you think you're so tough, for, from, for the Dungeon Master, um, to to put uppity players in their place. And it was designed for convention play. Yes. So ideally, the players sitting around the table are not so attached to their characters. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, the earliest version of this adventure was published in 1975 at the first Origins convention, specifically meant for tournament style play. So I can imagine there were a lot of players who used many, many characters that did not make it, sadly, throughout this adventure. Yeah. Anytime I see the cover of this adventure, I actually have an ever so slight pang of guilt because when I played through it, I played a druid who was able to thwart a number of the traps, and again, this is shameful for a druid, by summoning animals and sending them into the, into the dungeon. <laughs> Rich Baker once gave me the solve for this adventure, and that is to buy a flock of sheep. Yes. <laughs> yep. So you might be more familiar with uh, the, the more recent incarnation of this adventure, Tomb of Annihilation. Um, what I'll tell you is that Tomb of Annihilation, in contrast to the adventure it was based on, has, has a story. <laughs> Just full stop, has a story. <laughs> Showing up at the dungeon is kind of a story. It's just a very simple one. You create your own story of death and destruction when right, you play a dungeon right. crawl. <laughs> but, but this adventure is, is legendary for good reason. Um, the, the villain of it, Asera Rack, is how I say it anyway, mm -hmm. um, it has, like Tiamat, has been a persistent theme through the game for, for decades now. Um, a lot of lore has sort of built up around the Tomb of Horrors, uh, expressed in a second edition, Return to the Tomb of Horrors. There was this whole necromancer city alongside the Tomb of Horrors. Some of that lore has, has uh, persisted through the game's history as well, and then come, coming to flowering in Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. By the way, if you want to experience this meat grinder for yourself, um, <laughs> here at the show, Baldman Games is actually running the fifth edition update of Tomb of Horrors, from Tales from the Yawning Portal. It's a book we released a few years back where we did the actual work. Uh, but you can experience that adventure here at the show as well as another classic adventure mm. in the dungeon crawl vein, the Hidden Shrine of Tamochan, which is sort of got this kind of Mayan Aztec flavor to it, but both from the same era. So you can, you can recreate that experience of bringing a character you're not attached to to a convention. <laughs> Uh, I like the term meat grinder that you use, Chris, because that it really applies to um, our other dungeon crawl adventure that we are going to discuss. This is one of my favorites. This is another first edition adventure. Um, not, ju not just because it's this sort of classic cavern crawl, but because, and we talked about this a little bit behind the scenes, this is an adventure that came with a whole second book 
and the book had new monsters, and it had magic items, and it had creepy, weird, magical sigils in it, and other gugas uh, that you could pour over as the DM uh, before actually running the adventure so that you can, you know, uh, figure out what all these things do. But it really kind of changed my perspective of what can actually go into an adventure. And this, in fact, has influenced how we have approached the design of many 5th edition adventures uh, because that's why so many of them have large bestiaries, uh, partly because we just know we love Dead's kids. We Not only getting an adventure, but a bunch of toys that the DM could actually use in other adventures. Uh, because we, we love it when adventures are lootable. That uh, not only by the characters who can go into the dungeon and get their treasure, but lootable by the DM who can then uh, pick it apart for parts when building their own adventures. And this adventure was one of the first just fantastic toy boxes from that standpoint. This so, is, oh. so I was going to say, this adventure also gave us another classic iconic D&D character in the form of Igwilv, the yes. witch queen of Paranland. I love that you mentioned that. <laughs> I'm so who's, glad you did. Whose uh, sort of alter ego many people pr probably know better, and that is Tasha, yes. the wizard. So you were talking earlier about, uh, James, I believe, you were talking earlier about stories, uh, infusing stories into dungeon crawls and adventures and how that is um, a thing that is a little bit important to some people. And, uh, you know, D&D's history also agrees in that there are, when my little clicker works, there we go, several story-based adventures <laughs> that we've published about our history, many of which have origins in the, in the past and the earlier editions of the game. And we were joking when we were putting together this deck um, as we were discussing what are our favorite adventures um, and did we want to list our favorite adventures and build a deck around that, that immediately all of us said we shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea because the only thing we'd ever talk about is Ravenloft. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody here loves Ravenloft, big fans of it. I'll let them talk about that. Um, but here's where it all began. The uh, module I6, uh, published in 1983, written by Tracy and Laura Hickman, um, Ravenloft module that kicked off so many stories uh, that folks are still playing and will be playing. And, and Ravenloft, it, it can be hard to appreciate today how much of a tectonic shift this adventure was for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, before Ravenloft came out, there were hints of story in D&D adventures, but really those hints sort of just emerged through play, but there was almost never a sense of there's a narrative at work that your characters then arrive to participate in. It was much more before Ravenloft a place that you went to go explore. So the massive innovation of this adventure was still having an amazing place to go explore in the form of Castle Ravenloft, but introducing a villain who not only had his own motivations, but he also, unlike many of the villains prior to Ravenloft, was not stapled to the floor in a particular room. And, and because most of, the, most of the villains and monsters in previous adventures essentially waited in a room for the adventurers to show up. Strahd, the great vampire, actually, and again, at the time when this was released, it was mind-blowing, moves around. <laughs> and you can, you can meet him in different places in the adventure where he is seeking goals of his own. And that's the other thing that this adventure did, is it randomized some of the key elements, including what the villain wants, basically, yes. what you need to stop the villain, where the villain is likely to be encountered in, its, in his final form. All of these things were determined by a random mechanism. And that randomness then also made this adventure eminently replayable. So replayable, in fact, that as a kid DM, it became our tradition in my group of friends, some of whom I still play D&D with to this day, I would run Ravenloft around every Halloween, and because uh -huh. of that random element, people 
didn't know, well, this year, what is Strahd after? This year, where is the treasure hidden? Uh, it was, it was mind-blowing, and I love it to this day. While consulting with Tracy on Curse of Strahd, which basically built on the bones of Ravenloft, Tracy said he does the exact same thing. Every Halloween, he runs a game for friends about it. And one of the things we asked him was, what happened in all those games? Because some of those ideas were not in the original published adventure, and we were able to weave them into Curse of Strahd. It's a weird one where um, I didn't buy this when it came out. I didn't, and I didn't play it until a couple of years later. I remember playing it, I think, the summer after I graduated from high school, 86. Um, and the, the fortune-telling experience was the thing that just mm -hmm. sort of blew my mind uh, as part of this adventure, and it was creepy. Do you want to talk scary. a little bit more about what you mean? Like when the fortune-telling the fortune, So the, the fortune-telling experience is how, the, how that randomization happens, that you see a fortune-teller at the start of the adventure who does a card reading for you, and secretly the DM is, is writing down what the cards actually are indicating while giving you cryptic hints that, oh, the sinister one will be found in the grave of his ancestors or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very evocative and, and creepy. So, and Ravenloft um, had a huge impact on me going forward in that my first writing for D&D was um, for the Ravenloft setting that grew out of this adventure. Um, I then worked on the third edition expedition to Castle Ravenloft. So, near and dear to my heart. So other, other books that, and other adventures that allow you to really discover the setting and create story-based adventures, I, I really love the 2004 Shadows of the Last War adventure um, by Keith Baker because I just feel that it's such a unique setting. There are so many fun things that are so quintessentially Eberron, and pretty much everything that you think of as being quintessential to that setting is in this adventure. It's a thing that you, you discover exactly um, how dragon shards work. You discover what the houses are all about and all of their specialties, and that you really get immersed in the story in a way that I think is, is really significant to these types of adventures. And this, going back to what we were talking about earlier with small adventures and micro settings, a big adventure like this, Shadows of the Last War, shows how you can go even deeper into a world with a well-fleshed-out adventure. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Eberron, this is basically a, the D&D steampunk setting, you know, airships, uh, android-like people called Warforged, and this adventure does a great job of what I love to see in, adventure, in an adventure, and that is showing, not telling. That is, unveil the world by letting you go there. Uh, and letting you experience firsthand what is special, and then in this particular case, what is special about this amazing world where magic powers what is essentially technology. It also does a very good job of illustrating that D&D is not necessarily, nor has ever been a single flavor of fantasy. It's never been uh, maybe what you would expect when you hear the words D&D, and to help illustrate that, I thought that our last category would be weirdness in D&D, showing that D&D has published things that are completely outside the box and outside the norm of traditional fantasy since the very, very beginning, starting in 1980 with Expedition to the Barrier Peaks in which you would venture literally in a crash, crashed spaceship. There's a picture on the front page of the illustration booklet showing a mind flare in a space suit wielding, Chris thought it was a grenade, I thought it was a laser pistol, who knows what it is, something technology-like uh, that, that is just burned in my brain. As There's a, there's a section in the, the uh, 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide about flavors of fantasy, the, the last category, after talking about epic fantasy and heroic fantasy and mythic fantasy and dark fantasy, it says crossing the streams. Um, because this, this kind of weird science fiction and fantasy crossover has always been a part of what D&D is, going back to some of its, its fantasy fiction roots. And, and this adventure in particular did an amazing job when it came out of paying off on a promise from the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, because 
the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, you know, our very first DMG for D&D, includes in it firearms and nods to not only futuristic settings, but also even like a, in, in the form of Boot Hill, a cowboy setting, uh, showing that D&D has always been thoroughly weird. <laughs> and continues to be thoroughly weird, even all yeah. the way up to books that we have just published. Amanda. Including <laughs> Fans Over and Below, The Shattered Obelisk. So, a little bit of preface about this book. This book starts uh, with a mildly modified version of The Lost Mine of Fandelver, which was a 2014 adventure in the starter set, for those of you who remember that. It was many people's first experience with D&D. Uh, many people have very, very fond memories of that adventure. And this book starts with that adventure and then continues the story. And it continues the story in a way that is really quite unexpected and goes to places I think that would be considered pretty weird. It's fairly recent, so maybe no spoilers. But it's Fair. a little odd. It's a little odd. Yes, it is a place we don't get to go to very often. It right? is. And for good reason. It's a very strange place. <laughs> you don't want to be there for very long. That's, no. Bad things happen. <laughs> very, very tentacly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talking about mind flayers with technology, uh, mind flayers also have strange influences in this adventure. And there's just something so much more unsettling about an alien creature to that level also being influenced by something completely unexpected. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I can say this without being too spoilery about Fandelver, but uh, it, it puts me in mind of another adventure that is one of my favorites from the past, which is um, The Gates of Firestorm Peak from 2nd Edition, which uh, was the first introduction of what we now call the Far Realm. I think it called it the Far, far yeah. Realm. Um, it was a, a dungeon with a portal to the Far Realm through which things, had, things and energy had uh, seeped out. Yeah. And, and the Far Realm is this place that kind of exists outside the normal D&D multiverse. It is sort of antithetical to normal Euclidean existence. <laughs> it is alien and it is strange yes. and it is unknowable and that's what makes it a place that you probably don't want to hang out in very long. Yeah. It's weird. It's <laughs> weirdness. So I'm glad so you brought so up right that adventure because that's a good one. Yeah. And it's got a bit of everything we talked about. Yeah, a little Dungeon bit. Crawl. It's got uh, the sort of campaign element to it. Yep. Yeah, it's got the story of what exactly this weirdness is <gasps> and what's going at the on. the future. So we're gonna reverse uh, reverse engineer our uh, clicker here and go look into the future. Some amount of nausea is normal with this transition. <laughs> Don't worry, it's all perfectly fine. So coming up uh, in 2024, we have a few things that we would like to talk about. Things that we're excited about. Ooh. Ooh. So uh, one of the things is we, in the year of the dragon, the 50th anniversary of D&D, we are going to do multiple events that celebrate play. And the first of those, and this, these events will be short adventures that will be available to be played at stores, at conventions, or at home. However you want to basically interact with the adventure, you will have that option. Uh, the first of those is Descent into the Lost Caverns of Saj Khan. And this is a um, sort of distilled version of the classic Lost Caverns of Saj Khan adventure uh, that you can run in a single session of play. Very exciting. And if you do happen to run, play it at a convention next year, we actually included a tournament scoring system, so you could go old school. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I love see, the, how, see how you did. I can't wait to see players experience that for the first time and to hear what their feedback is. Yes, <laughs> and yes. Th who knows, people might even be uttering the term meat grinder. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It will never die. We won't let it. <laughs> so uh, in 2024 as well, some of you have already commented online about the images of Vecna that have been showing up around the convention, and we do indeed have a book being released in 2024 called Vecna, Eve of Ruin, and this is an adventure campaign that goes up to 20th level um, and involves a thrilling face-off against Vecna. We've also got a tour of the multiverse and a chance to meet some very famous people from D&D's history in yes. this one. Lots of, lots of iconic 
D&D characters, shall we say, stick their noses into the party's business in this adventure. And this adventure is not only meant to be this thrilling, multiverse-spanning story, but it is also specifically a 50th anniversary celebration because in it, you, uh, as, as they have hinted, you are going to not only revisit places and characters that have appeared already in fifth edition, but some that haven't and that go back to D&D's earliest days. And so this, this will be a, speaking of time travel, an amazing way to be both in the past and the future of D&D at the same time. So speaking of in the past and in the future, another 2024 book that we have coming for you. Ah, okay. Uh, so if you're familiar with Tales from the Awning Portal, that was a collection of old adventures updated to fifth edition. Quests from the Infinite Staircase is in the same vein. This is an anthology of adventures, classic adventures, uh, tried and true adventures that have been updated to fifth edition and are bound together with this sort of overarching elements. One of which is this chap you see here before you, this cosmic being. I'm not gonna tell you who he is or what he is, but he is completely new to the D&D canon and uh, a more familiar linking element, which is the infinite staircase, which is talked about in the Dungeon Master's Guide as one of the many means by which characters can get around in the multiverse. And so these two elements, this fellow here and the infinite staircase, uh, unite the adventures, bring them together, and allow you to move from one adventure to the next fluidly, if you so choose. And so, with the 50th anniversary in mind, another book that we wanted to bring out in 2024 was a retrospective historical account of the original Dungeons and Dragons with illustrations and manuscript notations and all sorts of just really fun uh, historical content that you can sink your teeth into to understand where did D&D come from. So yeah. if you want to recreate my experience of paging through these books and saying, how is this a game, <laughs> here is your chance. Yeah, the making of original Dungeons and Dragons, 1970 to 1976, is a chronicle about the origins of this game, um, how it came to be. It is a historical uh, perspective. And uh, we actually tapped a game historian, John Peterson, to help us create this product, which includes some never before seen correspondence between the original creators of D&D. In addition to also create, basically providing um, a replica of the original Dungeons and Dragons game, page for page. This book is over 500 pages long. It's a meaty tome. And, and again, a treasure trove, because uh, not only have these books often gone out of print, but never before have they been combined with the le letters between Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, as well as the historical context provided by John Peterson. Right? So the, the combination here, I think many of us will be poring over this book for years to come. So to lead us through some of these next descriptions, I am going to Pass the ceremonially pass, pass the clicker. <laughs> the time travel device. So one of, one of the huge ways that we are celebrating 50 years of D&D in 2024 is by releasing the revised player's handbook that many of you and thousands of others have been participating with us in the playtest process on through Unearthed Arcana. And this book, uh, will lead the charge of the three revised core rule books, the Revised Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, and Monster Manual. And this player's handbook will be the biggest player's handbook that D&D has ever had. Uh, not only is it the biggest in terms of number of pages, it will have more subclasses than player's handbooks have ever had. Uh, it has new spells, new feats, new weapon rules, including the weapon mastery options that many of you have play tested in Unearthed Arcana, and also 
mountains of brand new art. And you are seeing here for the very first time what some of the pages are going to look like in that player's handbook. Now I need to say right away, as it says also on the slide, uh, everything you see here is still subject to change. We are in the process of building this book now, uh, but you are getting to see art that is for sure going to be in this book, including this spectacular opening image for the fighter. And one of the things that we are doing in the player's handbook is giving each class a gorgeous full page uh, illustration like this to kick off its section of the book. And in addition to that, each class will also, for the first time uh, for the player's handbook, feature art for every single subclass in the book. And this book is going to have 48 subclasses in it. Every, every class gets four subclasses in the revised player's handbook. And you can see here a mock-up of the page for the champion. Uh, and my god, is she badass. <laughs> uh, and uh, you are going to get a host of new options in this book, all of which you can use with the fifth edition material you already have. We are carefully designing the material in this player's handbook so that you can build a character with it and play through your copy of Curse of Strahd, play through your copy of the Shattered Obelisk or any other adventure product you have for fifth edition. We are also making it so that a character built with the revised player's handbook can coexist at the table with a character built with the 2014 player's handbook. So if people still love the character they've been playing for years, you can keep playing that character. But I have a feeling when you see the new options here, you're probably gonna wanna transition your character over to the 2024 version. And many of those new options you've gotten to see and comment on through the Unearthed Arcana process. Uh, because we have continued our tradition for fifth edition, which is creating it, revising it, and playing it with all of you as one big community. And so, before I continue, just thank you for that. Uh, because your voices are heard in the glorious pages that we are constructing. Would you like to see some more? <laughs> so, this book also, and oh, I love these pages. Would everybody please ooh and ah? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, you I'm sorry, are. Sorry, that never gets old. I love that so much. <laughs> you are seeing here for the first time uh, what the background section of the player's handbook is going to look like. And one of the things that we wanted to do this time around with backgrounds is artistically depict them as a background. And so you can see here that each background is a place because what we want you to be able to do is imagine that this is where your character came from or a place like it. These new backgrounds not only have this spectacular art that brings them to life, but as, again, many of you saw in Unearthed Arcana, the backgrounds also have been redesigned so that it's now your background that affects your character's starting ability scores, and also your background gives you a special feat at first level that gives you a mechanical benefit that will remind you of where you came from as a character throughout your adventuring career. So if you have felt in the past, ah, my background is cool from a backstory perspective, but it sort of feels like when I get to higher level, it's not making much of an impact on my character anymore, we have addressed that. We want you to feel like I can still feel my roots uh, in my character even when I'm fifth level, eighth level, 10th level. There are many more backgrounds than the ones that you can see here. Uh, there are 
also, of course, the revised species that are in the book. There are gorgeous weapon illustrations. Every single weapon in the player's handbook is illustrated this time. Uh, one of our goals there is we wanted you to feel like you were getting a fantasy catalog uh, when you come to our equipment section. So for anyone who loves to have a shopping montage in their game, well, you as a player will now be able to have your very own shopping montage. Now, we, of course, have two more big core books coming. Chris and James, please tell us a little bit about the Dungeon Master's Guide. Yeah, we've only got a couple minutes left, but uh, just very briefly, you'll be hearing more about the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual next year. We'll be talking about it at the various PAXs and other conventions. Uh, this is just a little bit to whet your appetite, really. So the Dungeon Master's Guide is getting a similar uh, artistic lift as the Player's Handbook. We're all, we also know that um, people have struggled with the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide as far as its usability at the table, and so we're taking strides to make it a much more useful and accessible resource and reference book for new DMs and experienced DMs alike. The book is completely reorganized, um, also huge. <laughs> like the player's handbook. Well, it does have a complete campaign setting in it. It does have a complete campaign <laughs> setting in it, as well as uh, several adventures. Um, the, the chance to reorganize it and, and really focus on uh, introducing players to the experience of being a dungeon master uh, was a big part of this, but also a feeling that you're going to want to actually use this book. <laughs> is the goal, anyway, that uh, you're not just going to read it once and say, okay, I just need the magic items out of this. Uh, there's, there's a lot of resources. Although there are a lot more of those, too. There are. <laughs> yeah, there are brand new magic items in the, in the yes. Dungeon Master's Guide. Including items for all of the item, oh, sorry, all the equipment that the kids have in the cartoon series. Yes. If you, if you have ever wanted to wield the items that those characters have, we finally have them statted up. So not just Sheila's Cloak of Invisibility anymore. <laughs> now, the Monster Manual, the, the final of the three, continuing the theme of the biggest ever, will be the largest monster manual D&D has ever had. It has over 500 monsters in it, uh, including many new high CR creatures. Uh, we have seen that the, the game could absolutely use some new high CR threats, and so we are going to be unleashing into D&D campaigns new threats like the Blob of Annihilation. <laughs> if, you've, if you have ever wondered what a CR 20 or higher ooze looks like, <laughs> the new Monster Manual has you covered, and, but you do not want to be covered by this blob. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sounds sticky. <laughs> we, in the process, it tastes fruity though. In the process of building uh, new epic threats like the Blob of Annihilation and the Arch Hag and many others who will be in the new Monster Manual, we have new art for the monsters, tons of new NPCs because we know how much all of us DMs love to use the NPC section of the Monster Manual, so you're gonna have more of those than ever before. But this has also been a chance for us to revisit every monster in that book and give it a tune-up. So you're going to see uh, familiar friends that will, and foes, that work the way you expect in some ways but also work in ways that are entirely new. We are going through to make sure each creature has something distinctive about it so that the DM really feels like that when that monster shows up, something distinctive is going to occur at the table. We've also used this opportunity to beef up uh, many of our high CR monsters to make sure that they are more resilient and also they're going to, many of them, deal way more damage uh, than they did before. Uh, but their we, CRs aren't changing. Their CRs are not changing. We're just, we're just making sure that they are effective at their CRs. A absolutely. And that's been our principle throughout our work on all three books because we want to 
bring new options, refine the options that are already there, but also make sure that all of these fun new tools and toys work with the game you're already playing. And so you'll see that we've tuned up many spells, for example, in the player's handbook, but those spells' levels are not changing. Uh, we have tuned up monsters, as, as we've said. Same with magic items. A number of the magic items are getting a tune-up, but their rarities are not changing because we want everything to seamlessly carry forward from your current games to any game that you run that uses the revised core books. As Chris mentioned, we have tons more to share uh, in the months ahead, including more sneak peeks at art, uh, sneak peeks at some of the new game options that are going to be available uh, in the game. Uh, we will have videos online as well where uh, we will talk through how have things evolved from where you last saw them in Unearthed Arcana to where they're going in the final book. So it is going to be an amazingly exciting 50th anniversary, which, Chris, you often like to remind us, starts in 2024 and extends into 2025. Correct. So, and, but that really just comes from, I think many of us lo love to celebrate birthdays as long as we can. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with us about your favorite adventures or uh, uh, the, what we're doing in 2024, all four of us have a signing tomorrow in room 103 at 2 o'clock. You're more than welcome to come by and say hi, and we'll sign some stuff for you and chat. All right. Thank you all for being here. Thank Sounds you so much, great. everyone. We hope to see you then. Thank you all so much for coming to our panel. That's all for story time with the D&D design team. And um, yeah, find us around the show. Have a great time. <laughs>